Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Sebastiano Caboto, better known to the English-speaking world as Sebastian Cabot, was the son of celebrated Venetian explorer John Cabot. After his father's death, Sebastian conducted his own voyages of discovery, including seeking the Northwest Passage through North America for England. He is most appreciated by historians today, however, for his world map of A.D. 1544, also known as the Sebastian Cabot map. In this special episode, Heather Tesco of the Renaissance English History Podcast has graciously agreed to share with us her take on the significance of the renowned Sebastian Cabot map. Let's talk about the age of exploration in the context of a map of the world by Sebastian Cabot. The original of this map is still to this day in the French National Library. And the map is actually a map of the world that Sebastian Cabot created when he was still living in Spain. Sebastian Cabot, of course, was the son of John Cabot. The Cabot family had ties both in Spain and in Bristol and England. They were the earliest explorers in England whom Henry VII even had commissioned to explore the Newfoundland area. The map itself was something that Sebastian Cabot had created to show not just where he had explored and his father had explored, but also the lands that were claimed by different countries, by England, and that he had claimed and that his father had claimed. So in addition to the map, there's a lot of notations around the corner. The writing is so super small, and you can see all around the sides, you need a magnifying glass to be able to read all of these notations explaining the different voyages that were taken and what land was claimed and by whom. So that's kind of the story on why he created the map. But the map became famous in England, and it would go on to inspire a generation of explorers. And it became popular thanks to an engraving created by Clement Adams. The short version on Clement Adams is that he was born in 1519. He was a writer and an engraver and a school tutor who happened to tutor some of the leading noblemen in England, the friends of Edward VI. He was educated at Cambridge, he worked for William Cecil, and he wrote about voyages that were happening at sea. It's thanks to him that we know so much about the early voyages of the ships who tried to find the Northeast Passage. Adams was born in Buckington, Warwickshire, about 1519, as I said. He was educated at Eton, and then he went to King's College, Cambridge. He was elected a fellow in 1539. He got a BA in 1540 and an MA in 1544. And then eight years later, he became the schoolmaster to the king's henchmen. And then he died in 1586 and was buried at Greenwich. And those are like the facts that we know about Clement Adams. But the earliest mention of Adams in the literature of the 16th century is by his contemporary, Richard Eden. Richard Eden is actually known as the father of English geography. Eden was a contemporary of Adams, like I said. He translated works of travel writers and explorers into English, which helped to further the interest in exploration in the mid-16th century. And for this work, he received a salary of £20 a year. So in the mid-1550s, Eden translated the first part of Decades of the New World, which was a series of letters and reports of the earliest explorations of Central and South America. This series of letters was first published in 1511 and then later anthologized. Eden translated the first three decades and published them in 1555, and thus began the genre of English discovery travel writing, which stimulated English exploration in the New World. So Richard Eden was England's first travel writer. Richard Eden started to get people excited about all of the potential of the Americas when he published this translated first part of Decades of the New World. His translations were reprinted with supplementary materials in 1577 under a new title, The History of Travel into the West and East Indies. So back to Cabot and his map. He made this map, recording the discoveries of himself and his father, John Cabot, along the coast of Newfoundland in 1497. That was a trip that they took. And there's actually been a lot of argument and debate amongst geographers and historians about what they actually discovered. But that was the point of why Cabot made the map. Supposedly, there was a French map already in existence that was used as a base for this 1544 map, and Cabot's contributions to it were confined largely to notes on his own and his father's voyages, and to his opinions and his views and ideas about the navigation. There are a total of four known editions of the map. 
The first one is this one that appeared in the journal Science in 1883. This is in the French National Library, was created in 1544, and found at a curate's house in Bavaria in 1843. Then there was a map seen at Oxford by Nicholas Heshoff in 1666. That one was drawn supposedly in 1549. Then there was the map engraved by Clement Adams. And then there was a final one that supposedly was in the private gallery of the King of England that had the date of 1549, but disappeared somewhere in the mid-17th century. And one thing about Cabot is that it's clear that by this point, he was behind other cartographers. For example, he still has Newfoundland as a vast archipelago, and Cape Breton is a mainland. And there's actually French maps issued before this that are more accurate. So we can't take this Cabot map to be the truth of geography or even what leading cartographers at that point thought. Cabot was behind what the general intellectual consensus of the time period was. But it's interesting to see because this was more personal for him. This was him wanting to write down what his father had found, what he had found. And it was like almost a diary. So when Cabot came back to England, the new version of the map was created by Clement Adams. This was in 1549, and Cabot added some things to it. He particularly added a claim about one of his voyages he did, a northern voyage where he reached a channel between 61 degrees and 64 degrees north, which extended westwards for 10 degrees of longitude. This actually was excellent publicity for his view since the map was bought and displayed by merchants and courtiers although no copy has survived. But it was very popular. A lot of merchants bought it, a lot of noblemen bought it, and had it displayed in their homes. So Clement Adams did this engraving, and a lot of people bought copies of it, and it became very, very popular. There are several mentions throughout the literature of the mid-16th century of people talking about these engravings being in leading merchants' homes. A lot of merchants who were potentially trying to think about whether or not they were going to invest in a voyage or if they were investing and they wanted to show off just how much they knew about the new world, they would have a copy of this map in their shops to show people, look, I'm with the time, I'm totally right up there, and I know what's going on, and check out just how forward-thinking I am. So the contemporary of Cabot's map, discovered in Germany, the one I mentioned from the 19th century journal Science, is in the French National Library in Paris. The original is now lost. That was in a volume published first in 1594. Adams says that there's a legend relating to the discoveries of the Cabots to be found upon it, described by him as an extract taken out of the map by Sebastian Cabot concerning Cabot's discovery of the West Indies which is to be seen in Her Majesty's Privy Gallery at Westminster and in many other ancient merchants' houses. No copy of the map engraved by Adams is now known to exist. Sebastian Cabot had been saying for a long time that it was possible to reach the Indies not by heading northwest, but also by heading northeast above Russia and then coming down the side of Russia. This was something that Cabot had been believing for a long time and had been pushing. It took a good 15, 20 years of pushing by him and getting people involved and having people believe in him. Also, it was important that the Spanish and the Portuguese at that point had sort of had the monopoly on the trading routes and on the shipping routes. And so England wanted to find something new, something that nobody else had. And heading north and east seemed like an appropriate thing since they were already pretty far north anyway. When talking about Sebastian Cabot, Adams tells how certain grave citizens of London and men of great wisdom and careful of the good of their country began first of all to deal and consult diligently with him, Sebastian Cabot, who is described as a man in those days very renowned. His growing reputation is also shown. The imperial ambassador wrote a letter talking about him on the 4th of September, 1553. He said, the people of London set a great value on the captain's services and believe him to be possessed of secrets concerning English navigation. And then in 1594, another version of the Cabot map shows up, and that was edited by a German traveler. And he was in England in 1565. He was there to pick up antique and curious legends and monumental inscriptions that he could find for his book while he was at Oxford. He saw a document with some geographical tables, which had some inscriptions in Latin, but he says that he copied and printed in his volume, filling 22 pages of the book. They are totally in Latin, and they correspond substantially with the Latin inscriptions on the sides of the Cabot map in Paris, though there were fewer notes and inscriptions than in the Paris map itself. 
And so I wanted to share this cool story of this map and of the people who were circling around this map and circling around each other and leading in part to building this age of exploration that would come 30 years later, leading eventually 70, 80 years later to the colonies in America. But that early on, there was this map and these engravings of this map, which were shown in merchants' houses to show just how with the times they were. And I just think it's kind of cool that there was this schoolmaster who was teaching Edward VI henchmen, and he engraved this map, and that it would go on to make such a difference to the age of encounter, the age of exploration. I just think it's a cool story. So that is a little bit about Clement Adams. That's a little bit about how he circled around with all of these people. And then with Eden and his decades and being the father of English geography. I just think it's a really cool story how this map kind of ties everybody together. And everybody was circling around this map and these various editions that then were even found in the 19th century and became news and became popular all over again. Please consider supporting our History of North America series in the following ways. Join our growing community on Patreon. We offer lots of membership benefits, including ad-free content, bonus episodes, history-inspired artworks, and books. Receive an e-book welcome gift upon joining. Donate with PayPal and also receive an e-book. I've written many historical nonfiction and fiction books, including exciting international historical mystery and suspense thrillers. One such novel, The Dead Letter, is set in the beautiful Tudor England of King Henry VIII and his famous daughter, the Virgin Queen Elizabeth. All my books are available in print and digital format on Amazon. If you shop Amazon for books or anything else, make sure to use our free link so Amazon knows who sent you thereby giving us extra credit with no supplemental cost to you. All links appear in this show's description and on our website at markvnet.com. Spread the word to family and friends. And remember, all positive ratings, reviews, feedback, and comments are appreciated. This helps us expand our audience. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.